Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today with ADAC virtually for the Art of Being Bold with Sasha Bykoff. I'm Mary Logan Bykoff with Atlanta Magazine and Atlanta Magazine's home. Um, and first up, we want to thank our sponsor, Fabricut, um, with whom Sasha has a really exciting um, new fabric collection, which we're going to talk about some today. And first up, we're going to go ahead and see a quick video. Hi, I'm interior designer Sasha Baikoff from New York City. When I was designing this fabric collection, I firstly began to realize that my favorite part of design is fabric and textiles. And I just wanted to create something super fun and bring back this idea of novelty patterns into the interior design space. This collection is whimsical, it's fun, it's happy, it's feminine, it's pretty. It has an homage to so many different time periods. It's really just all about all of the things that I love that I want to share with the world. Hi, everyone, again. All right, well, I um, want to go ahead and introduce Sasha, who, as you can see, is um, really one of the design world's most daring, colorful, glamorous, genre bending. Um, and here she is. Hi, Sasha. Hi, How are you? Hi, Mary. I'm great. How are you? Great. Um, so, uh, I should go ahead and say first off that yes, um, you might have noticed we share a last name and um, it's not a coincidence. We did a little digging and figured out we may be second cousins once removed or something like that via my husband. Um, so we'll go ahead and get that out of the way. Um, so I also want to go ahead and let everyone know that as we're having this conversation, feel free to um, contribute questions via the Q&A function on Zoom, and we will take them at the end. So we're ready to go ahead and get started. Um, Sasha, so the Kipps Bay Decorator Show House was clearly a big breakout for you, and I'll, I'll show a few images of that in just a second. Um, you were assigned the staircase, which you know could be perceived as kind of an oft overlooked space, but it ended up being the most talked about space in the house. So what was your response to getting that space? Where did the, the vision for it come from? So when you, um, when you enter to Kips Bay and it goes through a process of judging and they pick out which designers are gonna enter the house, um, after the first year I entered, I didn't get into the house. The second year I did, I did get into the house. And um, I remember my first meeting really well. I it was I was like with like Jamie Drake and Bunny Williams and all these like really big time kind of d designers that I've always looked up to and that have always inspired me. And at the time they gave everyone a piece of paper and they asked everyone to write down the three top rooms that they wanted to do in the house. And my top choices were the living room, the master bedroom, and the dining room, obviously. And you had to kind of write what you would do with the rooms. And this was like a very classical townhouse on the Upper East Side. And I wanted to turn the living room into like a 70s disco club type thing. And I was writing like all this. It probably, it sounded crazy at the time. And um, later on, Bunny said to me like, what did you write in your description? Like, that was pretty wild. But anyway, like, obviously, little old me, um, <laughs> like, right. didn't get any of the rooms that I wanted because, you know, who am I compared to these, like, all-star decorators? And I got the staircase. Um, I, the, and in my mind, let me, I- Let me pause for just a second yeah. and show, um, show an image so everyone can see uh, what you ended up doing with it as you keep yeah. talking. So, so I, I got the staircase and I kind of started freaking out because I, in my mind, I had like decorated this like nightclub out of a living room. And the next day I was leaving on a three week crusade to Antarctica. And, you know, the biggest challenge of show houses is actually getting everything done in time. And, you know, you want to be able to custom make things and design your own things. And like, 
it was just so I remember calling Zira and I was like I need to come to the show house right now and figure this out so I zoomed over um, and I found myself like kind of like walking and dancing and sashaying up and down the floors and the staircase and I was like you know wiggling my hands and I had like jazz hands and the idea came to be in eight minutes and I was I, I literally timed myself it was eight minutes, eight minutes. I said to myself I said this there the landings are so narrow there's no room for furniture I need to create like a really bold artistic statement in the middle of the house the staircase is the heart of the home and I need it to be colorful and bold and inspirational and I needed to be very me. So I started to think of the 1980s Italian movement, Memphis Milano. I started to think of Miami Vice and, and the Art Deco revival period, like the 50s and the 80s in Miami. And I started to think of all these colors that I love so much that inspire me. Then I started to think about graphic motifs from this era. So I started to think about checkerboards and pizza wheels and lozenges and squiggles and polka dots. And, and I found myself like sashaying and dancing up and down the floors. And I was like, I need to create something that not only is bold and graphic and has color, but I also need to create something that has movement. Um, so Right, so I had this like vision in my head. I had this inspiration. Um, and so right after, I zoomed on over to the rug company, which was a sponsor um, of the show house. And we had to make, we had to get our rugs from there. And, you know, the challenge was, is like, I don't want to use something they already have. I want to make something my own. So I w zoomed on over there and I was like- Who was the rug company? <laughs> Sorry? It was the rug company. It's um was a sponsor of Kips Bay. They um they make they made the rugs for the show house. I zoomed over to the rug company and I started sketching out um, different rugs. About I think it was about six different rugs in, and each rug had two different colors. And I started sketching out um, what I wanted the carpets to look like and using classical Memphis motifs. Then I zoomed on over to Faro and Ball and I started picking out my colors. Then I zoomed on over to my friend, um, George, who makes wallpaper. And I started to, you know, design the wallpaper with him. And everything for the show house was designed oh. in one day. Sorry, that's my dog. Yeah. That's incredible. And so it really uh, helps launch your career. I mean, immediately, it went viral. It was in all the magazines. What sort of were the days following um, the launch of the show house like for you? What, what, um, if anything, changed for you? I mean, it changed my career forever. I think that you know, it's Kips Bay and show houses in general are such a good platform for um, being able to design and imagine your creations and like kind of do whatever you want. And that's the platform it gave me and it opened up a lot of doors and it definitely changed my career forever. All right, well, I wanna talk um, about the textiles that you've just created. Um, so this is your first collection with Bervin for Fabricut and you've got three designs. Um, how did you land on those designs? What was that process like for you? And I'll go ahead um, and share those as well. Yeah, so fabric and textiles have always been, fabric, wallpaper, patterns, prints, texture, color, it's always been my favorite part of design. And oftentimes I start decorating a room with a fabric and um, with a, or with a wallpaper. It, it's generally, you know, the starting point. And, um, because it's my favorite part of design, because, I, you know, I, I think that I'm so inspired by fashion and fabric, you know, is also part of fashion and interiors and, it, you know, you're able to like cross those boundaries and with the two, um, with the two like, you know, different art artistries, I guess, but I was, when I designed this collection, I was look, I was designing things that I couldn't find. 
And I was just, but things that I was able to find in the garment district in New York City when I would shop for fashion fabrics. And oftentimes I'd go to the D&D and I'd be drawn to what was then called novelty prints. Um, and oftentimes the novelty prints were discontinued. Like I remember shopping for, um, with, with um, I remember shopping for all of Iris Apfel's fabrics and her husband's fabrics. And I loved all of them and they were like from the eighties, but I couldn't get any of them because they were discontinued. And then I thought of this whole idea, well, like what happened to novelty prints? Like what happens to these fabrics that have like such a unique kind of whimsical vision to them. And that's, that's how I came up with favorite things, um, which is, you know, a kind of, beautiful crisp white background with multicolor um, iconic imagery floating and um, Uptown Toile came to me because you know I lived in Paris for two years I went to college there I love anything French I love anything like Marie Antoinette Rococo 18th century and I have always loved toiles but I've never been able to connect with, you know, the shepherds and the sheep and the rice fields and the corn flowers and this and the little like romantic country people uh, playing the violin and having like garden parties. So I was like, I, I, but I love twall. So I was like, I want to create a twall that like connects with people's lives now. And that's where Uptown Twall came from. Um, and then with uh, discotheque and lip gloss. Um, discotheque came from a fabric that was on a jacket that I had made by a fashion designer in Paris. And it's a beautiful like woven velvet that has this like slight metallic, um, like a starry kind of fun little shine to it. it. It reminds me of like a sky with stars at night and lip gloss is a panne velvet, but I, I mean, I call it crushed velvet and it's like the perfect shade of a velvety pink. And so it's a small collection, but it's a very cohesive collection that tells a story. So talking a little bit more about favorite things, um, You've said that that um, is inspired by elements from your childhood. And I'm just wondering more about some of your visual influences growing up. I think your mother was a ballet dancer and very creative. Um, what were some of the other influences of your childhood and your family? That, that I like you? ever since I was a little girl, I've always been really creative and I've always been really observing and drawn to beautiful things. And, you know, anytime I would travel or visit museums, I would really like take in everything in a very powerful way, which I think is like a really important lesson to anyone who's creative and who wants to constantly be inspired. I always, you know, I'd look at a painting and it would turn into like so many different things for me. And so with favorite things, it's really a pattern of culture in many ways. Like, you have um, Monet's Giverny water lilies. You have um, Saint Louis crystal glasses. You have heron swans. You have um, uh, the gardens of Versailles. You have, um, you know, uh, I'm trying. You have a Jean Paul Gaultier's corset he made for Madonna. You have. Um, Ferragamo's platform, which was the first platform heel ever made. Um, you have uh, uh, palms, you have lilies of the valley, mandarin trees. It's a combination of nature, fashion, art, architecture. You have the Dakota, which is a Beaux-Arts building in New York City. You have like this well-rounded uh, combination of imagery that inspires. Um, and there's a little camel table from Morocco. There's an Hermes Birkin bag. There's a pineapple. There's a, a white peacock. Um, there's the imagery of the Valley Russe, a mermaid, an Italian um, gilded rope chair. I mean, but it's interesting because these things um, in the fabric are things that I own or that I one time owned, things I collected, things that inspire me. And I always say that it's the fabric is not 
it's not really so much about me, but I think that anyone who has a taste for things that are beautiful in life can connect to something in that pattern. Like people have said to me, oh my God, like my grandmother had those heron swans or, oh my God, my favorite cocktail is served out of that brass pineapple or, oh my God, I love the ballet or I love Versailles or I love Marie Antoinette's bed. You know, just like there's something in there for everyone. And that's, and, and at the end of the day, it's a fabric that makes you smile. And that's, and that's, you know, what we're here for. We're, we're here to bring joy to interiors through fabric. So I want to talk more about your ability to bring so many different types of things and different styles together. Um, everything from Rococo to space age modern 1980s Memphis. Um, you're obviously interested in history, um, but also film, pop culture, fashion. Um, how do you sort of cultivate this, this mix? It seems like a lot of, yeah, it's a really great, a work. really great question, Mary. I have to say, it's a good question. And it's one that people ask me all the time. And I think that, you know, why do people hire designers? Why do people work to, for, with designers? And it's because a designer, a professional is going to give you that eclectic mix. And every designer is like every good designer or great designer has a signature look and a signature mix and something that they do well. Um, for me, when I started my career, I realized like being an interior designer is a really competitive business. Everyone, you know, says that they're an interior designer, but like, what's my signature and who am I and what is going to how is my work going to be set apart and be unique amongst, you know, a sea of interior designers? And I, I guess I like look deep into myself and I said, you know, what inspires me is these uh, certain eras in history. Like I always joke around and I say I was born in the wrong era. I should have been born in 18th century France or I should have been bo born during the Studio 54 era. It's like a travesty that I'm living now in 2020. One but or the other. They totally go together. Yeah. Or I should be in an era that mashes up the two. You know what I mean? And so like... I, I think about these different time periods and the actresses and the fashion that came out of them and the architecture and the design. And I'm drawn to these like eras and design periods that, you know, combine a certain femininity, but a sexiness and a coolness and an edginess. And I think that each of these different periods, um, in, like touch upon something that inspires me and something that I enjoy. Like I love to entertain and I love to have parties and I love to like, you know, be a lady of the eat of the night. So that probably like reflects my seventies aesthetic, but I guess like French 1960s, like I love like the whole fashion of Twiggy and like the whole, that that's like my fresh modern edge about, you know, like, the use of like plastic furniture and technology, you know, maybe that like stems from my millennial side. Um, and then like 18th century France, like I love the ruffles and the pastels and the, the ladies in waiting and the, the macaroons and the three tier cake desserts, you know? So it's just like little hints of things that, you know, inspire me kind of all mashed up together. Well, has anyone ever said anything to you like, that doesn't work, you can't do that? You, I mean, as far as designing product or with clients? Has anyone yeah, I mean, I have clients that, I have clients that kind of, you know, push back with some of my suggestions, but like, I, I'm an educator. My job is to educate. And my job is to push clients as far as I can and push their comfort zones. and. Um, and, you know, I obviously am not going to go like crazy on them and say, you have to do this. But, you know, I, I always, uh, I always give a good argument with how I think the things should look. And I always give my honest opinion and, and it's an educated opinion. I, I had a client recently that she, we, she really wants to do like black and 
gray, white, antique checkerboard floors um, in marble in, in her entryway, and she wants to carry those floors to the powder room. And I suggested we do terrazzo in the powder room. And she was like, the terrazzo and the checkerboard is going to fight. And I said, no, it's not going to fight because we're going to connect them through color. So, you know, how are you going to respond to that? Mm -hmm. Who's right there, you know? <laughs> um, I want to talk a little about, um, about sourcing things. I've heard you say before that you don't think about where anything will go in a room. You just um, scoop stuff up up that you love and figure it out later. So are you ever, are you looking for specific pieces? Do you collect things as you go? I know you've got a shop as well. Um, how do you, how do you source things and, and shop for things? So um, anytime I travel anywhere, whether it's for business or for pleasure, I always leave room to shop, whether it's antiquing or flea markets. And that's really where my head kind of goes in the clouds and I can like scavenge for, you know, old things. And for me, there's like such a romance, there's such a romanticism about it because you're just like looking at all these like vintage and antique pieces and you're wondering like where they've been, where they've traveled to, who owned them, how they lived. And it's like, it's a, it's a very like calming therapeutic type of experience for me. Um, I, I'm definitely connected to specific eras, specific designers um, throughout history. You know, there's, oh, sometimes there's something specific I'm looking for for a space um, and I wait until I can find it. But um, in general, I, I really believe that design is never done. It's something that's always changing and always evolving. And you know, I'm the type of person in my own home, I'm like constantly moving things around and giving like a table new life because it all of a sudden gets switched from the living room, like into the powder room or something. And then, you know, you put accessories on it and again, it forms a new life. And so I think that, you know, with antiquing and with vintage and sourcing the world for things, it's, uh, it's a very therapeutic experience that like that piece of design or furniture or accessory, it finds you almost. Where are your favorite places? Where have you had the best luck? My number one favorite place to shop is the Marche aux Pousses in Paris. That's like when I fell in love with design. And then all of the antique and vintage stores in Saint-Germain, um, where like deco off is actually that that's where I lived when I lived in Paris and the it definitely by far my favorite place to shop um, after that um, I love to go to Brimfield in Massachusetts uh, that for me is really really fun and also a great workout because you end up walking miles and miles through big fields so you can kill two birds with one stone I also love walking so it's like you know it's great but um, other than that, I love to shop really anywhere. I mean, I I've, I've go to Morocco all the time to Marrakesh and I'm an expert in the souk over there. Um, and yeah, just, um, just really anywhere in the world. I think that it's really important to find artisans. And, oh, I love shopping for design in Milan too. Milan is such a great place for design and especially contemporary design. So I would say, I would say Paris, Milan, and um, I guess Brimfields just to keep it high low um, would be my favorite places to shop for antiques and vintage. Tell us about when you're, when you're not working. I mean, I'm sure the designer is, is always in you no matter what you're doing, but um, what, what gets you pumped about life? What gets you excited? What makes you feel creative? What inspires you? Yeah, I think that um, the number one inspiration for me is definitely like being in nature. Um, I think that like my mind is always like dreaming about velvets and Chantilly lace and twalls and silks and taffetas that like it's hard to shut it off. So I think that in order to regenerate and come up with new ideas and fresh ideas, you have to be, 
you know, in nature. So for me, I like to like, I like the sun, I like the ocean, I like the woods, I like the trees, I like the fresh air. I, I need a repose and a reset. Um, and then after that, it's just traveling and um, seeing new things and going new places and immersing yourself in new cultures, um, whether it's, you know, architecture, art, uh, food, just traveling. Um, traveling inspires me in such a big way. Um, but yeah, those, those are definitely my two driving forces, I think. So during this period of quarantine and not getting to be out as much in the world as we would like to be, um, are you how are you sort of coping with that? Are you watching things, reading things? What are you doing at home that brings well, you? Well, I, um, right when things like got bad in New York City, I um, decided to leave to my father's house and he lives in Dover, Massachusetts. And um, he lives on like this really big property with like on the Charles River with trees and all types of animals like foxes and flying squirrels and deer and and it's a very like naturey New England environment um, and I felt like that would be a good place for me to quarantine for a little bit because it would give me that like reset repose inspiration but it's also in nature so I I was um, Edith Wharton for like nine weeks um, and that was inspiring for me I just kind of like thought of, I, I, I pretended that I had just like come off the Mayflower and I, I found myself talking with a British accent and um, <laughs> really, like really put myself in this like New England, like pilgrim setting, you know? So that was good. And then I switched over and I moved to the beach to Amagansett where I kind of got my like surfer girl, nature girl vibes back. And I was hiking a lot. I was surfing, paddle boarding, fishing. So I knew that I would go crazy in my apartment in Manhattan with no nature and uh, no nightlife museums or uh, friends around. So I, uh, I uh, was lucky enough to be able to get out um, and so the fact that I can't travel or haven't been able to travel this summer didn't bother me that much. Because I mean, of I'd love to apps. talk more about the being a pilgrim and the- Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, I was um, <laughs> yeah, I was like a Edith Wharton in a robe for nine weeks, so. Oh. Mm -hmm. Were you reading Edith Wharton? You know, I tried to, and it was really hard for me to read during quarantine. I couldn't like focus on reading. And um, I was like attached to the news, like in a really probably unhealthy way. And um, I actually, it's interesting because, so I consider myself like an artist and a creative and I decorate, but I also paint and like I design you know, sometimes I design my own clothing and things like that, but I channeled my creative energy into cooking this quarantine and into plating design. And I made some like really beautiful, colorful dishes. So I was like Edith Wharton, the chef. Very cool. And I'm sure you I also you wrote, I actually did, book. I wrote a children's book over quarantine. Yeah. So, a woman of many talents. Yeah. Yeah. I was writing a lot. So. It's important to channel as a creative and as a decorator, it's important to channel your creativity to all other outlets because like when you're, when you're an artist, you know, you really want to be able to kind of do it all. Right. Like Picasso, not that I'm comparing myself to him, but he was a painter, but also a ceramicist and so on and so forth. An all around creative. For exactly. Sure. Um, so I want to talk some about your, your, uh, product lines. Um, you're quite young. Are you 32? I just turned 33 on September 17th. Happy my birthday. birthday. Yeah. Um, but you already have so many, um, collections under your line and collaborate or under your belt. Yeah. Um, you've got, you've done a fashion house collaboration with Versace. You have had 
we've done a rug collection, lighting collection with Curry and Company, tile collection with New Ravenna. Now you've got this fabric collection. Um, how did all these come about? How did the collaboration start? What are you dying to do next? Do you have anything in the works next? Yeah, so I, um, I've, like I said, I love to design homes. I love to create spaces, but um, my, my favorite thing apart from that is actually like creating furniture and creating lighting. And, and, and I always like dream up of all these ideas. Like I see, you know, a tree outside and all of a sudden it becomes like a floor lamp to me you know that's how i think so um these came about i actually have a licensing agent um who they're very dear to me and they um after i i did my fabric cut license which was without them i realized that i wanted to do more and i wanted to go big with this so i hired a licensing agent and we focused in on what were the like important collaborations and things that I wanted to produce and what brands um, were a good marriage for me. And um, immediately like lighting, which I say is the jewelry of the home. And I thought that was so important for me because lighting is something that's so sculptural. Like when I see a pair of earrings, I think of them as lights, like things like that. And again, like fabric that for me has like kind of like a fashion and art, really fashion and art driven inspiration behind it. Um, tile for me, I, like I said, I travel all over the world and, uh, you know, whether you're in like chateaus or villas or, you know, you always see tile. And I thought the idea of creating something like more architectural, like a surface would be great for me. Um, my carpets I did on my, I did on my own, um, Stark manufactures them, but that was like kind of the first thing I did. It's not a license. It's just something I make on my own, but um, I'm half Persian. So carpets, I grew up with silk Tabrizi rugs from Iran. So carpets have always been like really close to me. Um, and I always have like really fond memories of like drinking tea and eating kebabs on carpets and um, just like everyone laying down and partying and, you know, on the carpet. So it's just it's just what I have a connection with. Um, my collection with Versace was obviously a dream come true. I mean, that was like a career highlight for me. It's my favorite designer. And um, my first designer dress I ever owned was Versace. So that was like a wild experience. Then my second collection with them, I actually designed two handbags, which is major because they let me go into the fashion um, side of things, which is super exciting. Um, and I like, I was on handbags. Yeah, I did it for my second collection for um, Miami Art Basel. I designed handbags, uh, two handbags, towels, robes, slippers, like all different kind of gifting accessories, uh, bedding. So that was fun. Um, I really would love to see my fabric cut fabric on like pajamas or robes or something. Actually, this summer we made a caftan with my Uptown Toil uh, for Kips Bay and it came out so amazing. Everyone is obsessed with it. So I'd love to see my fabrics being used um, on fashion, but um, in the future, I just signed a license with Walters Wicker and I'm doing an outdoor furniture collection, which I'm really excited about. And um, that's that's new that I have in the works right now. So like, we- can you tell us about that? Um, I, okay, I will give you a little, a little sneak peek, but it's inspired by, it's very 1950s, 1960s French inspired. So it does have a little bit of that like atomic space age thing to it slash 90s RLX, which is was like Ralph Lauren's sport in the 90s. So it's a, it's a really, it's really cool and edgy. And it's, again, not anything that's out there because I would never want to create something that already exists or take someone else's idea. That's uh, not my style, but um, hopefully it'll be ready soon so I could share with the world. But um, I'm excited about that. Yeah.
and uh, hopefully uh, for all the Fabrica people out there, we can make some more fabric soon. Yeah, I was going to ask that if you, um, if you're planning on releasing any more with fabric. I would love to, I would love to do more fabrics and wallpaper, you know, like we did this collection so quick, like we did this collection pretty fast and it's a lot of artistry and a lot of work goes into the patterns because they're so detailed, especially the twall. Um, and it was a lot of back and forth because we all wanted everything to be so perfect. And um, I have so many more fabric and wallpaper ideas that I would love to do. So I, I think that, you know, hopefully we'll be able to, we'll be able to do that. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited for what the future holds. I love my fabric cut family. <laughs> I'd actually love to hear a little bit more about the process of creating the toile. We didn't really get into that. Um, yeah. So, um, how that happens? Yeah. So, I um, did a deep dive into. So, a, a lot of what I do, I, I, I do a lot of research. Like, I am a night owl. I stay up all night researching all different things. And um, it's really important, I think, as a designer to do that research because you know, although we're not scientists and doctors here, like what we do still has to come from an intellectual and ward, uh, worldly background. You know, I'm, I, I'm not just going to uh, walk into a client's home and, um, you know, make a bunch of stuff up that I have no idea what I'm talking about. So, um, so I, when I thought of my toile, I immediately thought of like Brigitte Bardot in like Saint-Tropez and I thought of Audrey Hepburn and I thought of Slim Aarons and I thought of um, Jane Birkin and I thought of just like, you know, Marilyn Monroe and all these like female star uh, Hollywood French actresses and um, of like kind of different eras and then I thought of photo, and then I researched photographs or I already had, you know, the ideas of photographs in my head or images from of um, different scenes that I loved. So like, for instance, one scene in the Uptown Toile is a Brigitte Bardot-esque looking, looking woman walking down Fifth Avenue um, with two standard poodles um, and, um, and she's wearing a, like a, an outfit that Audrey Hepburn wore at Breakfast at Tiffany's. And um, the poodles come from an old Avedon fashion figure, uh, fashion photograph. Um, like I was, I was researching fashion photography, like um, Avedon of Verushka and things like that. And then there's another scene of, of that same woman um, on, water skiing on a Riva, which is a Slim Aaron's image um, from Khan, and so on and so forth. Just uh, different imagery from film and photography. Uh, another image of, um, of a woman and a man dancing in a nightclub, and that came from uh, Serge Gainsborough and Jane Birkin. Uh, so, you know, different, it, it all has a historical context. I actually would love to do an Uptown Toile, uh, a, a male version of an Uptown Toile called Gentleman's Toile. I would love to do something like that because I already know the images in my mind that, yes. um, well, I can't say it. <laughs> um, well, I they love- come, They come from like, a lot of them come from some of my favorite movies. Okay. Yeah. Well, I love all the references. It's, it's really um, part of what makes your work so interesting. Um, you know, there's always a backstory and there's, you know, like I said, lots of, you know, historical references and it's smart. It's not just beautiful or cool. It's, it's smart. It makes sense. So um, shifting just a little, um, social media has clearly been important for your career. And I'm, I'm wondering if or how that impacts how you design. Yeah, I mean, it's really funny when I did the Kip Space show house, a lot of people are like, well played, like, 
great for social media. And it's like, I wasn't even thinking about that. You know what I mean? I, I It's not something that even crosses my mind. Um, my whole thing with social media is I have an interesting relationship with social media. Like I'm, I'm not an influencer, right? An influencer is someone who's job is social media and then they may get like licensing deals or they may get business from being an influencer. I'm a designer. So my work is my interior design. And yes, I have an, an Instagram following because of my work. But um, I, my Instagram is sharing with the world, you know, spaces that inspire me and sharing with the world my work and my fabrics and my furniture and things like that. Um, is it a tool for me to get business? Not really. Does it happen? Yes, of course. Um, but it's really more of, again, a way to educate people and let people like kind of like enter into my train of thought and my brain. And, um, for the most part, I want my Instagram to inspire people and to teach people because I think that a lot of what I do, people are afraid of. And it's what I do is not safe and it is bold and it is different and it takes courage and commitment. And I think that when you show the world and clients um, spaces from all different periods in all different places, um, with all different design aesthetics, it educates them and it opens their eyes more towards a certain pattern or color or furniture choice. Um, I think that people that play it safe with their interiors, they just don't know. So I use Instagram to teach people mm -hmm. and to inspire people. I think it's just another way you can sort of push design forward and put it out there in the world. Um, exactly. And yeah. also it's a way, I think that for us all, all of us designers and all of these Instagram accounts from different uh, interior brands, I think that, you know, it's a way for people to really engage in interiors. And, and I think that a lot of times like, people have been more interested in spending the money on a pair of shoes than a, you know, a slipper chair. And mm -hmm. it's like, damn, you're going to spend, you're going to go spend all that money on those Manolo Blahniks, but there's a beautiful Napoleon tasseled slipper yeah. chair over there in the corner that would look really nice by your fireplace. And I always have that struggle because my friends are like, I'm not buying that chair. I need a new handbag, you know? So I think that also now, especially with Corona and like how none of us are really going anywhere. Um, I hope that all of our Instagrams kind of um, make help. Well, not, I don't know, I guess make people invest in their nest more. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably very true. Yeah. Um, I want to hear about Donatella Versace because it's been said that you guys really hit it off. I think you were the first fashion designer they'd worked with, I mean, interior designer that Fashion House had worked with. Um, tell us about that relationship with her and how that um, developed. Yeah, so it's actually a crazy story. Maybe it will be made into a movie one day, but I was sitting on my couch um, in the Hamptons, minding my own business, doing work. And um, all of a sudden I get a message on my Instagram, hi, this is urgent, um, please, give us your phone number. And I was like, hi, sorry, please email info at sashabycuff.com. And they're like, no, this is the message was like a random, a random person, like freaky. And I was like, they're like, no, this is like top, this is confidential. We need your number. And I was like, hey, sorry, like please info, email us. Like, no, we need your number now. And I was like, sorry, what is this regarding? And then they, they're like Donatella Versace. And I was like, Okay, so I give them my number and all of a sudden this like Italian phone number calls and I was like, hello, and they're like, hello, and I was like, hello, and they're like, hello, and I was they're like, this is like, we're calling from the offices of Donatella Versace, and she wants you to design a collection and installation for Salon de Mobile, and I was like, what? <laughs> Come again? Did she find you on Instagram? 
So apparently she went through like 200 portfolios of different interior designers and my Kip's face staircase was on her mood board. I want to hear how crazy this is. My outfit that I wore on the cover of Array magazine and that I wore to Kip's Bay and for all the photographs was Versace. So all the pictures of me in front of the space the year before were Versace. And so here she is, her team calling me, and they're basically like, we want you to be in Milan in three days. And three days later, I was on a first class trip, Emirates to Milan, and my life totally changed. Hair, makeup, driver, a whole atelier of people working for me. And, um, you know. Hair and makeup? Oh yeah. At, like walked into the store, so many outfits, shoes, bags, hair accessory, looks, gowns, everything I wanted. I mean, this was a Devil Wears Prada situation. You know, when she like first gets that job at Vogue, that's what this was. Um, and it was just like a dream come true. I mean, for like someone like me, I guess I was 30 at the time to collaborate with my favorite brand in the entire world is like wild and the stars were really aligned and I joked around that my grandfather and Gianni made a deal in heaven because when I like as little as I can remember my grandfather was like always wearing Versace and the silk shirts and our apartment in Miami was all Versace and the fond like the most beautiful my mom ever looked in a gown was when she was wearing this like purple Versace gown with uh, metallic stars on it. And I remember how jealous I was of her at the time for having that dress. And my first designer dress was Versace. So this was like, and as I was on the phone with the Versace team telling me that they wanted me to come to Milan, I was staring at my Avedon images. I have these photographs in my house of Avedon pictures of, of the Versace home campaign. And then I, it was, it's like, it is, it was the craziest thing ever. And so. then what about meeting her and getting to know her? I, I just, I feel like I read somewhere that. She, yeah. She's, she's, a, friends. she's a very, like, she's a very busy woman, obviously. And, um, she is a, she is like an inspiration. She's a queen. She's like a force. I mean, she is like Donatella Versace, like doesn't get more fabulous than that. But um, at the end of the day, she is really warm and motherly and everyone that works for that company, it's like you're part of a family. And I like the first time I met her, I actually like teared up, like I cried because I was like, this is so like amazing meeting you. And I, I was so appreciative. And like when I got to my hotel room, she had like written me a really beautiful note even before I met her and like sent me all these gifts and like just like her and her whole team just like the entire time just showered me with like love and hospitality and it was really really amazing but like apart from that relationship you know I have that relationship with my uh collaborators in the United States as well mm -hmm. so I feel like really lucky that all of these companies and brands that I work with are so so like just so sweet and so nice and I think that is um that says a lot about the industry that we're in and how we're kind of like all in this together and you know we create beautiful homes and beautiful things for the homes but you know everyone's so hospitable like my curry family when I went to high point for the first time and that's a joke I went from Milan to high point, that's what we say. Um, my, the, my Curry family, I mean, I've never experienced Southern hospitality before. I was shocked with the home cooked meals and the accommodations and the, the libations. And every second I had a drink in my hand and a fresh farm to table food. I mean, it was like, I, I, and I love high point because of it. <laughs> so, so, you know, I feel really blessed in that sense. Well, you've had a lot of great collaborations. Um, so let's talk more about the times that we're living in. Um, your style has been described as party girl. You know, your work is anything but quiet. Um, but these are kind of quiet times. Does that change 
um, what people want? Does it, does it change your vision, your design at all? Um, no, because I think that in life we all go through like hard times and we all have bumps in the road and, um, it doesn't like, this is not breaking down my spirit. Maybe in, in the beginning it was a little bit, maybe I went a little crazy in the beginning, but, um, (laughs) when I was Edith Wharton, it may have gotten a little dark, but, (laughs) but, um, no, like this hasn't broken my spirit. If anything, this has made me realize that like, we need to like actually push harder and, get people to um, make their homes their happy places and their oasis. And, and if anything, like, I hope that this like kind of like dark and gray time is uh, convincing people to change their uh, color palette mood a little bit. Well, I totally see the, the appeal in that. Yeah. Um, so, I think we're ready uh, for questions from from our audience who we know nothing about. We cannot see, it's so funny. Um, But if you have any questions for Sasha, please um, submit them via the Q&A function, or I think you can also do it through the chat function to me if you wish. Um, Let's see, yes, they say correct. You can send them through the chat function to me as well. Um, so that's it for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess we're just waiting for questions. Mackenzie, do we have questions? Okay, we, let's see. All right, we have some questions coming in. Um, this is from Eva and she is asking what your design process looks like, Sasha. So how do you start? My design, I look at, I look, well, I never had any formal training in interior design. And I said, never studied interior design and I didn't work for an interior designer. So my, I actually have a background in art history and fine arts and that's what I study. And so the way I look at design is like how I look at a blank canvas, a, a room is a blank canvas. And I start with the, the floors, the walls and the ceiling and I build up upon that. So a lot of times it starts with a carpet or it starts with a paint color or a wallpaper. Um, and then as you, were, as you would build up on the canvas with paint um, is how I would build up on the space. And I just keep adding and adding and adding to that. Okay. Um, we have another question from Danica, which is, what is your dream project? My dream project is a hotel for sure, because I love traveling and I love, um, I love like hospitality and like being able to design a hotel that maybe live in full time, but you can visit and, um, Here. I stopped being able to hear Sasha. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, that's strange. Okay, um, let's see. Oh, I, I didn't hear the rest of your, I'm so sorry, I don't know uh, what the, the my technology dream project, My yeah, dream project would be, where would it? My dream project would be a hotel probably in South Beach, Miami, or in Paris. Okay. And I know you've done the cafe at the Plaza Hotel with El Decor using yeah, your- Yeah, that was a dream yeah. job for me. Yeah. That was a dream job for me. I put Uptown Toile in Lavender and Rose all over that place. I grew up as a little girl. Going, I grew up on the Upper East Side in New York City. And on Sundays, I would get all dressed up and go with my grandmother, my great aunt, and my mom to the plaza for tea. And also my favorite book growing up was Eloise. And I thought I was Eloise. 
And uh, when I got asked to do the plaza, I was like, again, bucket list moment, like stars aligned. And um, I, my inspiration was Eloise grew up and she designed a bar at the plaza. Now she's clubbing. <laughs> Love it. Okay. Um, this is a great question from Katie. What is the children's book about? <laughs> um, I really don't want to divulge too deeply into it, but it's a children's book for decorating. Okay. So I guess it comes off the premise that like, there's like children's books for painting and there's children's books for doing sports and for doing all different types of things, but I couldn't find a children's book to teach how to decorate. So and, it's like a how to. It's um, kind of, I guess it gets a little deeper than that because there's a storyline to it, but it's basically the idea that um, decorating is a form of self-expression. Mm -hmm. Love it. Yeah. Um, if anyone knows any publishers, send them my way. Okay, I was going to say, is it actually being yeah. published? So far, the world doesn't seem to understand it, but we just have to get them to. It, all, it, it also all rhymes, so. Oh, I love it. I can't wait. I need an advanced copy. Um, let's see. Where can we purchase your products that you've designed? So you could per purchase the fabric at um, the Fabric Cut showrooms um, all across, or um, you can find your uh, the regional sale sales member in the area that can um, help you out with that. And then um, for all my other products, um, you could uh, visit my website and it will direct you to where you can find it. Um, like for instance, my lighting collection um, is Atlanta based curry. So, you know, that's easy to find there. And um, yeah, just the World Wide web will uh, send you in the right direction. <laughs> Great. Um, we have another question from someone anonymous. How are you so fearless? Did your family really support you as a child? Um, how am I so fearless? Actually, the opposite. I, um, I'm very, very independent. And I think that's why I'm so fearless. Like my mom used to say to me, anytime I used to ask for help or assistance or something, my mom used to say to me, pretend I'm not here, pretend I'm not here. So I like grew up really independent, really doing things on my own. I would travel to places at a really young age on my own. I like lived in other places away from home as a, as a young girl. And, um, you know, I've been kind of like, you know, on my own for a really long time. And I think that that's what fearless for sure. But I think that fearlessness to believe in yourself and own it and be proud of it. Um, okay, someone else has asked, how has your design business changed the last six months? Well, listen, I'm gonna be honest with you all because you know everyone's like, I'm so busy, I'm so busy. I was not busy. February, March, April, May, June, not busy. Um, busy designing like collections and doing things, but in terms of clients and interior design, no, because you know, in New York City, you're not really able to go into apartment buildings. If you're not a resident, you can't really um, have workers or contractors in homes, not that people want that anywhere way in their home right now. So um, I, wasn't, I wasn't really that busy, but as soon as August came around, I became really busy. And now I have a lot of projects um, outside of Manhattan, um, in Florida, Connecticut, um, Mexico, I have Miami, just all more outside and then in the Hamptons. And I'm just starting to get back into people's homes in New York City. Um, next month, I'm, I'm going to be in people's homes in New York City. So um, things are starting to get back in action. And it's really hard to transition back into work mode. Let me tell you. 
After being Edith Wharton all this time. After being Edith Wharton slash nature girl slash surfer girl, I'm having a really, really hard time. But I have a client meeting after this uh, panel and I, you know, spent days for the first time back in the D&D building in New York and it felt good to be back there. Except when I was kicked out of some places for not having an appointment. <laughs> but that didn't happen at Fabricut. <laughs> <laughs> and are you doing all this work virtually at this point? Um, no, now I'm, well, yeah, with the travel, like I'm not going to Mexico. Um, I'm doing a project in Mexico. They want to fly me there, but I was kind of nervous about flying internationally. And, um, you know, so I, I, I have, I never, I didn't get Corona. Um, and I feel like I've like made it this far. So I should just like keep being a good girl with that. But um, no, I'm like meeting clients, um, you know, in real time now, just um, doing more virtual stuff when it comes to my like uh, national and international projects, working a lot with CAD and renderings, um, which is hard because, you know, to really get a feel for the space, you have to be there. But, you know, what, it's, it is what it is. Well, on that note, it is what it is. No. Um, well, it sounds like you've got a lot. You know, as a decorator, I always say I'm a problem solver. So I'm here to solve problems, not complain. Well, it sounds like you have um, a lot of exciting things coming up. And um, I think it's time for us to wrap up. So I want to thank um, everyone for being here with us. Thank you so much, Sasha, for your, your time. You. It was a great conversation. Really great time. Great questions. And thank you to ADAC and Fabricut. Um, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you.